Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. It's by the grace of God and the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that I haven't found a need or an excuse to take a drink today, nor have I found a need or an excuse to take a drink since May 28th of 1973. Wow. Uh, well, I had a really good time this weekend. I got to tell you, they um, hopefully not with the exception of this morning. You had some wonderful speakers. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> um, I, I would like to have asked Tim how did he marry her four times? Yeah. Jesus, I. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been married twice, and I at least different women, you know. I just, uh, somebody's got a high tolerance to pain, and I don't know which one of those two or both. Um, <laughs> that's a scary thought. Uh, and how many conventions have you gone to? Where the Al Anon speaker was a six foot four, 230 pound teamster. <laughs> My goodness, that boggles the mind. Um, I really enjoyed Mark. We, we, uh, uh, we have some similar history. And, uh, and the guy that he mentioned, uh, Don P., uh, was my sponsor for 31 years before he died. Um, you are a treasure, Liz. <laughs> you are. My goodness. Um, and I am really in awe of you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm a member of the Alcoholics, Alcoholic Olsons from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we've been dying of this disease ever since my family originally got here in the middle 1800s from Norway. Uh, the last one who died from this disease is my dad. Um, when I grew up, there was alcoholism all around me. Um, I lived in the kind of family where uh, if the noise got the noise level got too high, you started getting under the furniture because you knew the next thing that was going to happen was the guns were coming out. Um, I wound up living in uh, a whole lot of foster families when I was a kid, and by the time I was about 12 or 14, I was completely shut off emotionally. Um, the whole idea of parents and family by that time had pretty much disappeared. And um, and it's kind of a trick today because I have a hard time connecting with people except for my immediate family or my, my children today. I can get real close to, but basically I've been a loner most of my life. And it's a trick to kind of come out of that uh, after you've been in it for so long. And I'll, I'm going to talk about that. Um, uh, basically, all I want to do is talk about recovery. I can tell you that I drank a, a fifth a day for uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 years. Um, I was an everyday drinker. Um, it created enormous problems in my life. When I was, uh, I started drinking when I was 17, uh, and before that, I was a model. A uh, young man. Um, I was vice president of the junior class in my high school. I was head of the citizenship committee. I was head of the church youth group. Um, I started junior achievement in my hometown. 
And then I went out and had a few beers, and within six months I was sentenced to a Wisconsin State Penitentiary for assault with a deadly weapon. Um, they came and arrested me right out of football practice. Uh, <laughs> I had been rousted uh, by some police officers in the town next to where I live for being drunk and disorderly when I was 17, and I took immediate and violent umbrage at being hauled around and pushed around like that. So I took a rifle and I went out to this power substation that provided the the electricity for that town and blew it out. Um, I, I have just small moments of being vindictive. Um, <laughs> And when I did that, there was a guy there that came out and took offense at what I was doing, which is pretty stupid considering I was armed. Um, and uh, anyway, I walked. I had threatened him, threatened him. I told him uh, th that it was stupid to confront someone with a gun and that he's lucky to walk away. Uh, I was too, frankly. And uh, the state um, tracked me down and said, I can't do things like that, Bob, and uh, <laughs> sentenced me to a term in one of the correctional facilities in Wisconsin and then did exactly what they did to Mark, which is to say, how would you like to go in the military? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought that was a good option. Um, and I was trying to think about the right way to do that because I didn't want to get shot. I mean, my idea of fun wasn't out going out someplace and getting shot. So I, I thought, which one is the least likely to get me shot? And I went in the Navy. Um, I think they kind of knew where we came from because they put me on something that's euphemistically called a shore fire control party. <laughs> And it is not a party. <laughs> um, so I wound up sneaking around in the middle of the night in places like Beirut, Lebanon, uh, calling fire in off the Sixth Fleet. Um, now, I don't look like anybody from Beirut, Lebanon. <laughs> so you might as well go ashore with a bullseye on your forehead because that's about where you're going to get. And, uh, and wound up having some facility for doing that and uh, and they had this business when I got out. I had the same nightmare for almost 10 years after I got out of the military and I what I knew was that that was a real high-risk endeavor <laughs> um, and I knew that if I did it enough that I wouldn't get back uh, because we really got chewed up uh, in a couple of places, and uh, and I used to wake up for ten years. I'd wake, sit up in the middle of the night <clears throat> in a dead sweat, trying to figure out where the heck I was, and hoping I wasn't where I thought I was. Um, and back then they called that battle fatigue. Now they call it PTSD, and they put you in the hospital for it. Um, I, it just went away after 10 years. I don't know what happened. Um, I drank a lot. I got out of the military. Uh, I, I kind of got to be a, uh, uh intensity freak. I don't know how to explain that any other way. Uh, if my life wasn't intense, I didn't think it was living. I was living. Um, I went to college for a while. I actually studied chemical engineering at the University of Wisconsin. And this is part of the paradox of my whole life. People could never figure me out. You know, one minute I'm the president of, the, of some class, and the next minute they're, I'm heading for a penitentiary. And uh, I was in the top 3% at the University of Wisconsin, and they told me that I should, I should get out of the, the chemistry school and go to medical school. And... Uh, and actually suggested that I go to the School of Psychiatry. <laughs> now, 
considering that I had this refrain floating around in my head for years about what's the matter with you. Um, when I was uh, when I was 16, my mother, who thought I was nuts, um, started giving me part of her prescription. She had uh, some real mental illness issues, and uh, they had her going along on phenobarbital, and she thought I was probably as crazy as she was, so she started feeding me her phenobarbital. And then she sent me to the psychiatrist. And I went to the psychiatrist, and about the third time I showed up there, I was sitting in the lobby waiting for him, and the nurse came out, and she had this sort of stricken look on her face, and I said, what's the problem? And she said, he just committed suicide. And I thought, everybody's nuts. Okay? And I thought, what is this therapy? They're killing themselves. At least I don't have a gun at my head. Um, um, I got out of the military, and I got a job as a bill collector in Chicago. <laughs> um, you know, if you get shot at a lot, in the military, collecting money in the projects isn't all that tough. <laughs> So they had, down in Cabrini Greens, they had snipers on the roof, on the roofs, on the tops of the buildings. At, you know, so what? I, uh, and uh, so anyway, I, I survived all that, drank like a fish. I did, while I was doing that, it was interesting because I thought I was absolutely fearless. And, uh, and sometimes when I tried to get up in the morning, I couldn't even get out of the fetal position. And I'd have my knees stuck up against my chest, and I couldn't even get them down. And uh, back then, doctors occasionally still made house calls. And uh, my wife asked the doctor to come over, and uh, he came over, and he said he was trying to talk to me, and I was telling him I just I couldn't get out of that position. And uh, he said when, when he's like that, uh, get some real hot tea and put about three shots of whiskey in it and give it to him and he'll get out of it. And it, that's probably the most perceptive doctor I've ever met in my life. <laughs> um, but it, it was just raw, raw fear. Um, it wasn't unusual for me to walk in someplace and have a gun right in my face. And um, it was just nuts. But it was interesting making amends for all that, incidentally, because I used to do something that uh, that Mark described, and that I weighed 240 pounds. I could bench press more than my own weight, and I would kick in somebody's door and walk in there and slam them up against the wall and tell them they better give me the money or I was coming back with a baseball bat. And they believed me. Um, and it was curious to go back to people and say, I really regret having done that. And I, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, is, is there anything I can do that make that right? <laughs> and they said, you know, the common answer was stay the hell away from me. Uh, Well, let's just fast forward. It, um, I went actually worked for a consumer finance company. Uh, they knew I was a good collector, so I went to work for them. And uh, and something started happening. I moved right up the ladder. I went from an assistant or from a collector to an assistant manager to a branch manager, and then ultimately to the director of public relations and advertising for a multi-branch company. And they thought I was a very talented young man. Uh, I also got involved in the JCs, and I was drinking this whole time, and uh, got involved in the Miss Wisconsin pageant. Jesus. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, none of this makes any sense. It just uh, and and there was a paper mill, largest uh, largest magazine paper mill in the world. Consolidated Papers was in the same town, 
And uh, the the uh, director of personnel came over to see me one day, and he said, Bob, we'd love to have you as a salesman for Consolidated Papers. And he offered me twice as much money as I was making. So I went over there. And what they asked me to do was to go out and entertain their customers. <laughs> and that's my job. That was my job. I went out and I entertained their customers. And I'd be in Chicago one night. And I'd be in New York the next night. And I'd be in Wilmington, Delaware the next night. And I'd be in Kansas City the next night. And all we did was get drunk. Go out. And they, and they just loved it. I said, our customers just love you. <laughs> <laughs> and when I quit drinking. Right after I quit drinking, I saw the, the chairman of the board on the street one day, and he said, hey, Bob, let's go have lunch. And I, we went and had lunch, and I told him, I said, I quit drinking. I can't do this anymore. And if that means that you don't want me doing the job that I'm doing, I don't want to do the job I'm doing. And he said, we're not trying to kill you, Bob. We just know that our customers like you. So um, I had moved to a little town uh, in Wisconsin, Fond du Lac, and uh, and just everything came crashing down. I mean, at some point you just wear out and everything goes to hell in the handbasket, and that's the end of it. Uh, I had been going to Alcoholics Anonymous for about five years. I started in 1968, couldn't get it. I'd walk into an AA meeting, people would stroke me. Tell me I was going to be all right, you know, just kind of hover around you and try and hug you back into health. Uh, that stuff doesn't work for me. Okay? They kept telling me I was going to be all right, and it was a monstrous lie. It wasn't going to be all right. And people kept saying, keep coming back, would keep saying things like, keep coming back. And, I, you know, my question was, what the hell for? Uh, I knew I was going to die from alcoholism. I watched my family do that. I was just going to be one more. I figured I'd leave the planet about 30. And uh, by the time I quit drinking, I was 35. And uh, I really didn't think there was any hope for me. And I, I don't even know why the hell I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't think I got anything here either. I'd walk into some Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and I'd say, how do you stay sober? And somebody would say, well, just keep the plug in the jug. And I would get so furious, I want to fight. It, it, if my jug had a plug in it, I'd put the, excuse me, I would put it in there. And they'd say, don't drink and you won't get drunk. That's obscene. <laughs> Are you kidding? If that's all you got to offer some drunk walking in the door, you probably shouldn't say anything at all. <laughs> they kept saying all those inane things that I didn't understand. They don't make sense to me. I know that once I start drinking, and at some point I will start drinking, that I can't stop drinking. And if you tell me something like, bring the body and the mind will follow, I'll look at that and I'll go, that's some kind of hokey stuff, right? I just, I don't get it. Give me a solution. Uh, in uh, 1973, my, my wife took off with her two sons and went to France and just, I thought that was the end of the deal. Uh, I woke up on the floor of an empty house um, I'd been on like a five, six day run and drunk and, and got back to an empty house and laid down on the floor. And, and the problem is that when you drink that much for that long, you know, something ugly is going to happen when you stop. And, um, and I was on the floor and, uh, these two guys showed up from Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't even remember calling him. And the one guy who had, who had offered to be my sponsor before had brought this new guy with him. And the new guy, whose name was Dick, appropriately, uh, <laughs> was dancing around me going, Oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going to happen here? 
He's, he really looks sick. Is he going to go into DTs? What are we going to do with him if he goes into convulsions? Oh, my God, what's going on here? And see, if I would have had a gun, I would have shot this son. <laughs> So they picked me up and they took me to a halfway house called the Blandine House in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, stuck me down in front of a priest. Oh my. <laughs> See, I was brought up a German Lutheran and we did not have a high regard. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he said, are you alcoholic? And I said, uh, yes. I uh, am. Yeah. And he said, is your life unmanageable? And I said, for God's sake, they just dragged me in here. <laughs> and he said, are you done? That's a trick question. I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, if I'm not done, I'm dead. Um, well, my liver at that point was the size of a football. Um, I had I had been through DTs before, and I knew what was coming, and people told me. You, you know, they had told me eight years before that a doctor said, do you drink a lot? And I said, no. And he said, uh, well, I don't know what you're doing, but your cholesterol is so high that your chances of a heart attack or a stroke are 80% in the next four years. And he said, so if you're not drinking, something's wrong. And I don't know what you're doing, but if you don't stop doing it, you aren't going to be around very long. You can't scare a drunk. You just can't scare a drunk. It's like, oh, okay. Well, I didn't plan on living that long anyway. Uh, so I said, I don't know if I'm done. And he said, you believe in God? And I said, uh, no. And I said that just to irritate him. And he said, well, then I guess you're out of luck. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? And he said, can you stop drinking? I said, no. And he said, well, I got some bad news for you. We can't stop you either. And I, I said, you can't? And he said, no, we don't have enough people in this building or in this city to take to stop you from drinking if you want another drink. And, it, you know, I'm wondering why I'm there. If uh, I came all the way over here to look for a solution, you say you can't do anything? And I said, why am I here? And he said, well, you better, there better be a God. Because if you can't stop and we can't stop you, if there's no God to stop you, game's over for you. And I said, I, I wouldn't even know where to look. And he said, what do you know? And I said, I know now I lay me down to sleep. And he said, well, uh, why don't you think about what you'd got, like God to be? And they sent me home. They had, a guy, <laughs> they had a guy drive me back to my house. Now, that you know, that's a pretty innocuous thing to do, just drive you to your house, except I knew what was going to happen. <laughs> they, they didn't have any treatment centers. So so I knew that when I got home that things were going to start coming apart and then they were going to really start coming apart. And so they left me in this empty house. And sure enough, um, I, I went into DTs and uh, hallucinations and all this different stuff. And I saw ants coming out from under my refrigerator the size of this podium. And I was terrified. I lived in this house, and it had a small kitchen in it, and I was watching all these huge ants crawling out from underneath the refrigerator. And I, I grabbed the refrigerator in a bear hug and picked it up and moved it across the kitchen to find out where they were coming. There weren't obviously any ants, but... And moved it across the kitchen and set it down looking for the hole these huge ants were coming out of and ran into the basement steps and got three cans of Raid and and sprayed the whole kitchen. I emptied three cans of Raid in there and damn near asphyxiated myself. <laughs> I probably still have effects. Uh, 
after it, anyway, I flopped around in there. You know, I knew I was going to die every minute because I, I felt like my heart was going to seize up. In every minute of the next 72 hours, I knew I was going to die, and I was just waiting for it to happen, and I was as nervous as a cat, and I was jumping around, laying down, and I was trying to pray at the same time. And I was praying in Old English and New English and on my knees and on my back and on my stomach. <laughs> And it seemed, I had this idea in my head, I don't know how to make God listen. And and so I tried everything that I thought might be appealing to God, and I need, knew I needed to get to the right deal, because if he wasn't listening, the game was over. Uh, after about 72 hours, they came back and picked me up and took me to a meeting. Um, I went to meetings that week, and one of the meetings I went to was a men's meeting. And... Uh, and all these guys in the meeting who had been sober for a little while were talking about how good sex was with their wives. I, um, I was impotent. And I didn't say anything at all. Most of I couldn't say anything, but I mean, I wouldn't have said anything if I did because they seemed to be having a really good time. And, uh, there, and uh, there was no good time for me. And anyway, my wife hadn't come back, so it didn't make any difference. Uh, and I went in and I saw the priest after the meeting, and I said um, that that meeting was about how good their relationships are with their partners, and I'm impotent. Uh, is it something really is wrong with me? And he said, no, it isn't about half the men that got, gets over are impotent for a period of time. And I said, well, all those guys are saying they're having a good time, and he said half of them are lying. <laughs> That's the first time I, I figured out that people lied in AA. <laughs> Isn't that? It's a good thing to learn right away. Uh, the book says that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholic. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we're like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. Presently maybe means or ever will be. I'm not like other people. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I am an alcoholic of the worst kind. I'm chronic if I ever start drinking again. I'll tell you, after after almost 33 years of sobriety now, if I start drinking again, it ain't going to last long. Um, Liz is right. The progression just stays on. And um, so... Um, I was trying to figure out if I was an alcoholic for sure. <laughs> and the book says if when you honestly want to, you can't you find you can't quit entirely. Or once you start, you have little control over the amount you take. Well, um not quitting entirely means I'm never going to do that again, and then you don't. Well, that one didn't work. And then it says or, which means that's good enough. But I looked at the second one just to make sure. And then it said, uh, once you start, you have little control over the amount you take. Yeah, if I start, they're in the nut. So I just kept drinking. I have no second thoughts about being an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. The trick is, do I think that that makes me something less than someone else? And it doesn't. It just makes me different. I had trouble with that for years because the only, the only plane that I could think in was more than or less than. And people go, are going, there's another one there. And the other one is different than. And I am different than other people. I'm an alcoholic, and therefore I can't ingest alcohol or it does terrible things to me. And it, I, I wound up with something that my dad had, and that was, that was a, uh, a Jekyll and Hyde personality. Violent personality change that occurs when I drink alcohol. As soon as I ingest alcohol, I become what the book calls dangerously antisocial. 
I used to walk into bars and in bar restaurants and bars, places in Wisconsin. Oh, they all have bars. Uh, <laughs> And I'd walk in there and sit down at a table to have dinner with my wife, and I would look at some guy that I'd never seen before and immediately hate him and want to fight him. And it wasn't unusual for me to get up and try and drag the guy out outside the fight. And and I'd walk into a restaurant with my wife, and she would go, please, Bob, don't do that. Just don't do that. Um, and I didn't know that the trigger was alcohol. Hello. <laughs> um, I moved to, uh, when I was a year sober, I, I moved to Denver. And, uh, and I went to, uh, to show you how long ago that was, I went to a Sunday night young people's meeting at uh, at York Street, and there was a guy standing there, and it's the guy that Mark was talking about, Don Pritz. And he was talking about the big book, and he was talking about being a textbook for people like us, and that it had a set of directions in it, and that if you followed those directions, that you never had to drink again. And that more importantly, you didn't even have to want to drink again. And I'd never heard that. Maybe someone had said it to me, but I'd never heard it. And I heard him that night, and I heard him in spades. I I heard what he said, and after the meeting, I went up to him, and I said, you know, I haven't had a drink for a year, and I'm going to drink again, and if I drink this time, I won't survive it. And he said, uh, are you looking for a sponsor? And I said, I, yeah, I am. And he said, are you willing to sit down with me once a week and start at the forward to the first edition and do everything the book says? And I said, I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to not take a drink. And he said, well, tell me what you've done so far. And I told him about, you know, while I go to meetings and I try and be helpful and I'm trying to be a good person and all that. And he said, well, Bob, it looks like you did everything but follow the directions. (laughs) <laughs> so I went over and sat down at his kitchen table and uh, and we went through the first step and it's not hard to concede you know concede means give grudgingly it means you don't have to like it, <laughs> it you, you got to agree with it you just don't have to like it hell no I don't think anybody initially likes being an alcoholic you just have to do something about it. Um, and we got to the second step. And the book says, are you even willing to believe? And upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built if you're even willing to believe. You know, it doesn't take much. That's why so many groups are called mustard seed. It's just a grain of faith. And if you have a grain of faith, I think... I think God just accepts that and and starts giving us grace. Um, then the book says, crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we could neither postpone nor evade. We had to fully face the proposition that God either is or he isn't. He's either everything or he's nothing. And then the next line is, what is your choice to be? My self-imposed crisis is an alcoholism. It's my self-imposed crisis is that I can't fix myself. Okay, um, I have a progressive and deadly disease, fatal disease, and I can't stop the damn thing. I can't even slow it down. You know, they they figured out what my IQ was when I was at the University of Wisconsin, and if there is some way to mentally adjust yourself to overcome alcoholism, I would have found it. Um, I couldn't even slow it down. I had always been able to think my way out of things, and I could not think my way out of this. Uh, I can't postpone it. You know, I can't take two months off from my alcoholism. I'd like to come to Atlanta and leave it in Denver and, you know, and and, uh, come back and pick it up later. Uh, I can't evade it. 
Um, I, it just, uh, um, it is me, I am it, it follows me, I can't. I mean, I, I have to deal with it. Um, there's a thing in the second step called the bedevilments. And that's, we can't seem to be a real help to other people. We're prey to misery and depression. There's a whole laundry list there of things that happen. And, and it talks about two different kinds of people in that kind of, in that part of the book. And the two kinds of people are people, um, who have God as the central fact in their lives. And then this other group of people who suffer from the bedevilments. And, and the, uh, every time today, that I, it starts talking about pomp ceremony and the worship of other things is we lose our focus on God and we start thinking about those. It's almost always the worship of other things. And the other things, just in case you ever get curious about that, are um, sex, power, and money. Those are the big three, all right? And when I start worshiping one of those other things, then God is no longer the central fact in my life, then I'm off to the races again. Then I'm back turned inward. And so today, when, it, when I start seeing that my life includes the bedevilments, I have to go back to this point where I understand that God truly is the central fact in my life. Um, God either is or he isn't. He's either everything or he's nothing. Well, God is part of something. doesn't make any sense at all. So I believe that God is. And I did all that as a, as a leap of faith. One of the things you're going to find out in Alcoholics Anonymous is that you're going to have to take a lot on faith. And if you're unwilling to do that, you're just going to have a big problem. We have an old expression around Denver about trusting God, which is an enormous issue. Because when we get into difficult times, um, you know, it's very hard to trust God. And it's, it's the, the expression there is the hardest part about trusting God is trusting God. Um, and I will tell you something about drunks and about me in particular, and that is I will never, ever, ever turn to God unless I have exhausted every single resource. <laughs> You all got it. <laughs> um, my God, I said y'all. Uh, uh, that's not part of the language in Colorado. Uh, it will be. Well, if enough of you folks move out there, we'll probably all be saying that. Um, About that time, the 1975 International came along in Denver, and I was on the hospitality committee, and uh, and we listened to a guy from Winnipeg uh, who's dead now. His name was Mac Cheater, and he was part of a group in Winnipeg called the Golden Slippers. <coughs> they were called the Golden Slippers because nobody could stay sober, um, <laughs> and and. Uh, I suppose out of desperation as much as anything, they decided that they were going to change what they were doing, and they decided that instead that they were going to quit rationalizing about the steps, and they were going to quit intellectualizing about the steps, and they were going to take a radical new approach towards Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is they were going to do the steps. <laughs> and a very strange thing happened. Uh, they almost all stayed sober. And... Um, We were all really impressed with that. And about 15 of us decided we were going to do exactly what they said. And even though I had started in the steps with my sponsor, 15 of us got in the basement of this guy's house. His name was Jay Levy. We got in the basement of his house, and we started at the forward to the first edition where it says to show others precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And we started right there and did everything the book said to do. When it said write, we wrote. When it said make a decision, we made a decision. 
Uh, when it says make amends, we made amends. When it had any kind of direction at all, all 15 of us did that. I can tell you, well, let's see, what is it? Uh, what's it, 20, uh, 30 years? One guy died from alcoholism. And he died, he froze to death in the doorway. He decided he was going to drink again, and walking around in the winter in Colorado, drunk is not a good thing to do. And he froze to death. Um, the other 14 of us either are sober and alive today or died sober. Um, this thing really works. I don't know what perverse part of our nature it is that says that we have to put poetic license in the middle of this program. But I will guarantee you that if you do it right by the numbers, you never have to drink again and you never have to want to drink again. And if you want 33 years of sobriety, if you don't have it already, that's a good way to do it. Um, when we got to the third step in the group, uh, you know, my sponsor had said selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our problem, right? And I looked at him and I went, what is that, some kind of Zen thing? <laughs> you got, uh, and I said, the root of my problem is I get a bottle of whiskey and I just want to drink it. And then once I start drinking it, I got to go find more whiskey. That's the root of my disease. And he said, no, Bob, selfishness, self-centeredness, Selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear are the basis of your disease. And I said, that doesn't make any sense to me. And he said, doesn't have to as long as you believe it. And uh, uh, driven by a hundred forms of fear. My God. Well, we'll talk about fear. Um, so... Um, we, what we did was we read that third step prayer, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt relieve me of the bondage itself that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And he said, uh, we're coming back in a week and everybody that wants to take that can, but understand the deal before you come back. And then he sat down with me and he said, do you know what that is? And I said, well, I think so. And he said, well, tell me what it is. Well, if I offer myself to God and he's going to build with me and do with me as he will, that means he can do anything. And he said, that's right. Uh, that's not a good prospect. Um <laughs> Relieve me of the bondage itself that I may better do thy will. I truly am focused on myself. You know, my life drinking was like living with a, with a periscope attached to my forehead, aimed right back at myself. And all I could see was me. And that truly is the bondage itself. I have no way of being of any service to you. I only have this way of seeing myself. You, you want to know what the essence of the spiritual experience is? I mean, after all this time, you know what it is? If, if you want to boil down an experience, spiritual experience, it's going, when we walk through the door, everybody's saying, where's mine? Okay? We all come in here with this attitude about where's mine. And after you have a spiritual experience, your attitude will be, what can I do for you? That's the essence of the spiritual experience. So, uh, take away my difficulties of victory over them, may bear witness to those I would help of God's power, love, and way of life. Uh, bearing witness means being an example. And let people see that 33 years ago I was a hopeless, helpless, knocked down, drag out, no future drunk. And that today... Um, I am a productive member of society. Um, I, I have five children, two grandchildren. I have five sons and two grandsons. And it, there hasn't been a girl born in my family since 1936. 
one. If there ever is one, she will be spoiled. Right. <laughs> I, you know, if if I was going to be born again, I would want to be a girl in my family. <laughs> Let people see that that God's power, love, and way of life really work, even with old, broken down trucks. Um, well. I came back the next week. It scared the hell out of me. I thought, I, I'm, I'm going to be selling uh, religious tracts on some corner in Uganda. And I uh, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm just a kid from Wisconsin. I'm putting me someplace. In, uh, and I came back, and my sponsor looked at me, and he said, well, are you ready to do this? And I said, no. And he said, then I can't help you. And I said, I didn't say I wasn't going to do it. I just said I didn't want to do it. And he said, well, we're all going to get on our knees and say this prayer. And 15 of us got in a circle on our knees and said that third prayer together had enormous power. It felt like it lit up the room. Uh, And I I got up. uh, We were all on our knees. And I got up. And my sponsor's looking at me, and then he laughed at me, which I thought was wholly inappropriate. (laughs) Uh, And I said, what's so damn funny? And he said, you don't want to give God that kind of power in your life, do you? And I said, no. And he said, Bob, God's got all the power anyway. (laughs) He said, this is just an exercise in who's God and who's the drunk. Huh. <laughs> said, did you bring your uh, legal pad? And I said, yep. And he said, then we're going to start writing inventory. And we read the part about writing inventory about how we make a grudge list, which uh, seemed an impossible task for me because I had a grudge against almost anyone I ever met. And... Um, it says we list people, institutions, and principles, and in the first column we write down who who they are, and second column is the cause, third column is the how it affected our self-esteem, our security, our ambitions, our personal relations, our sex relations. Some people write pocketbook in there. And he said, so I want you to make a list of all people and institutions and principles that you take exception with or that you have a grudge against. And I said, okay. So I went off and I wrote this whole thing. Um, it was almost all people. And, um, and I came back and I said, okay, I have that done. And he said, now in the second column, I want you to write down where you're mad at him, but I don't want any more than maybe five, six words at the most because you don't learn anything in that column. And I said, okay. And I wrote down why I was mad at him. And then in the third, he said, and then in the third column, I want you to write down how that affected those areas of your life, self-esteem, security, ambition, personal and sex relations. And I said, all right. And I was a salesman at the time over the road, so I would get in a motel at night and I would write this inventory. And then I came back and I said, all right, I'm done. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, what did I miss? And he said, the fourth column. And I said, what is that? And he said, where were you selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? And I said, all right. Uh, And I went off and did that. And he said, and by the way, put all that ticket to the grave stuff in there too, but put it at the front of your inventory so you tell me about it before you tell anybody else you're going to be sweating all the way through your fifth step. (laughs) Everybody has to take it to the grave stuff. It's usually about sex. Yeah, You know, unless you've figured out some way to get in a rocket ship and do it with a laser, half the people in this room have done everything you've done. <laughs> she says, you know, I've been listening to Fist Test for over 30 years. <laughs> and I asked the priest one time, I said, you ever hear anything new? And he said, not after about the third one. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. They probably heard it a bunch. 
Um, so I came back, and I said, well, I'm done. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, what's left? And he said, the fear inventory. And I said, I don't have to do that one. And he said, why not? And I said, I'm not afraid of anything. And he says, is that true? And I said, uh-huh. And he said, well, this book says that fear is an evil and corroding thread in the fabric of our existence is shot through with it. And I said, well, maybe somebody else. And I said, you know my history. I was, you know, I was, I was in the military and some stuff, and I was a bill collector in Chicago, and um, I just, I don't deal with it. And he said, okay, um, humor me. And I said, all right. And he said, how about snakes? And I said, what kind of snakes? <laughs> and I, he said, rattlesnakes. And I said, well, you'd have to be a fool to be one, locked in a closet with one of them. And he said, all right, well, so write down rattlesnakes. And I said, okay. He said, how about spiders? And I said, like black widows? And he said, uh-huh. Um, well, I, uh, you don't want to get bit by one. And he said, no, you wouldn't. So write down spiders. How about failure? Oh, cheap shot. <laughs> um, people always told me I was going to wind up in a gutter like my dad or in a mental institution like my mother. And they just, when from the time I was about that big, they told me I had no future at all. And I thought they did, you know, because they were adults and they were authority figures, I thought they were right. Um, and he said, write down failure. How about inadequacy? And I said, well, the truth is I never thought I was as good as other people. And he said, write down inadequacy. How about the police? Well, Don, you know I have a history with the law. Um, and he said... Uh, well, so what happens when a cop car pulls up right behind you? And I went, I don't like that. And he said, uh, write down the police. How about the courts? Well, they were the ones that sentenced me. And he said, write down the courts. How about women? And I went, well, uh, 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 he said, just write down women. <laughs> How about children? And I said, only the infants. You know those ones they wrap up real tight in those little blankets? I'm always afraid I'm going to drop them. Yeah, I don't want anybody to hand me one of those. And he said, write down infants. And then he didn't say anything for a while. He's just kind of looking at me. And uh, he says, uh, is there anything you're not afraid of? <laughs> And I said, I guess not. Um, fear will steal everything in your life. It'll steal your present. It'll steal your future. It'll steal your ambitions. It'll steal everything about your life. It'll steal your relationships. It will steal virtually everything. That's why fear ought to be classed with stealing. Uh, so I came back and, and said, I'm done. And he said, no, you're not. And uh, he said, now you're going to write a sex inventory. And I went, well, we finally got to a part that I'm really going to shine at. <laughs> and, uh, and I found out that every... Every intimate relationship I had ever had had been selfish completely. And uh, when I actually, when I was about seven years sober, I was writing a sex inventory, and uh, the questions in there about did you unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness just struck me. And what I found out was that I had such low self-esteem, such a diminished sense of self-worth, <laughs> that I thought any woman who would ever get with me, if I ever allowed her to get both feet squarely on the ground, she'd be out of there faster than I could spit. 
So I never let them get their, get their feet on the ground. And I use jealousy, suspicion, and bitterness to keep them off balance. That's not a recipe for a good relationship. So I came back and said, I'm done. And he said, yeah, you are. When are you going to fifth step it? And I said, anytime you're ready to listen. And he listened. I, I thought that when he heard my fifth step, because I have been down some seriously muddy roads, that at the end of the fifth step, he was going to get up and say, okay, there's a couple of things, Bob, that I'd like you to do. And here they are. First of all, I don't want you anywhere near my wife or my children. <laughs> I don't want you to let anybody know that I'm your sponsor. And I think that we really ought to minimize contact in the future. <laughs> and I thought that was going to be his response. And he got up and he hugged me. Just absolutely um, blew me away. And the reason why was because I never thought anyone who had a clear view of my past would have anything to do with me. Um, let me let me jump. I, there's something I really want to talk with you about, about inventory. When I was 28 years sober, I was, I was doing my 11th step, and I, I knew that I had a bunch of things that I believed about myself that were really self-destructive. And those were things like this, and I'll give you the real ones. If you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Um, I'm a fraud in everything, in Alcoholics Anonymous, in business, in life. Um, my only value to women is my ability to make money. Um, um, I will never, ever have a relationship with someone that lasts until I die. Um, I am worthless. Um, everything that I have succeeded in life is in is dumb luck. Um, I virtually have no future. And I'm doing my 11th step, and at that point, I write inventory once a year. I go through the steps once a year. Where I, where I go to meetings, they say there's a line in the book that says a, a business that takes no regular inventory is sure to fail. So we take regular inventory. I had been writing inventory for 28 years straight, and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of those things that I believed about myself. And I was in my 11th step, and I was having a conversation with God. And I said... I. I don't, it's like dragging an anchor. I don't know how to get rid of this stuff, and uh, I need an answer. And the answer that I got was principles. And I thought, I mean, it was like hearing a voice, principles. And I went, what's that got to do with it? I don't know, and principles are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness, and all that stuff, aren't they? And And I hear principles... And I know that there's a line in the book that says that we inventory people, institutions, and principles, but I never could really get to it. I mean, even after all that time. And then what I heard was your principles are those beliefs in your life that are so deeply seated in your personality that they become sacrosanct, that you will never, ever challenge them. And those beliefs that you have described to me are your principles. They determine every, every decision that you make is based on those principles in your life. And it's about time you dug them out and you became the person that God always intended you to be. So I thought, well, you know, this is like spiritual make-believe stuff where you're sitting there going, I don't trust this. And so I got out a piece of paper and I put, I put the belief in the first column. If you knew me, you really wouldn't like me. And in the second column, it said the cause. And I thought, what made me believe that? 
And what made me believe that were all those people that told me stuff when I was a kid that were either mad at me or they had some perverse sense of humor and they just gave me bad information. Um, and then I got to the third column and I said, does that affect my self-esteem? Ooh. Oh. Does it affect my security? Oh, my God. Does it affect my ambitions? Yeah, it stops me right in my tracks. If I don't think that I'm smart enough, good enough, worthwhile enough, I will never try anything. Okay? Does it affect my personal relations? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I really don't want to meet people. One of the reasons why I've always been a loner is because I didn't want people to see who I was. Does it affect my sex relations? Yeah. Yeah, because one of those people that I don't want to see me is the woman that I'm with. It was like the lights went on. Okay? Now, this... this I don't want to wander too far from the book, and I, I have reached the point where I don't think it's wandering from the book at all. Um, I write inventory on principles the same way I write it on people and institutions. But I can tell you that I had an experience in the middle of that that was one of the most freeing experiences I've ever had. And see, what I know today is that people come into Alcoholics Anonymous with a head full of nonsense about who and what they are. Okay? Um, you know, I'm not going to get all the way through the steps today, but I want to talk about a couple of things. One of the things is, do you have the courage of your convictions? And I had this, there was a guy who died recently in Denver with 37, 38 years, was the head of a group there. He was a six foot six attorney that had been drafted into the New York Giants, and he was big and mean and ugly in... Uh, abrasive as hell and confrontive as hell and he helped more people than I could ever imagine helping. But he was. Jesus, he was hard to talk to. And he came up to me and he said, what do you stand for? And I said, well, I'd have to think about that. And he said, then you don't stand for anything. Oh. What are your principles? What principles do you live by? I had to write mine down. We have a choice here. See, we, we come into this program with all these funny ideas about who and we, what we are. An awful lot of them we inherited. Some of them we developed. Some of them were the product of experience. And until we get rid of those things, we will spend the rest of our life dragging an anchor. And one of the things, you know, uh, Liz said the truth will set you free. I think Martin Luther King said that also. You need to know the truth to be free. And until you're willing to look at the truth, you're going to spend your life in bondage. If you don't have enough courage to do this, you get exactly what you deserve. At some point, desperation will make you suck it up and look at it. And if you don't have the courage to go do that, you will never, ever reach the potential that God had in mind for you. So, what do you stand for? Look, when somebody comes into an AA meeting and they're, and they're sick and they're dying... Are you going to tell them to keep the plug in the jug? Or are you going to tell them I can show you precisely how to recover? I've never seen anybody say that in an AA meeting except people in my group. Okay? You know why? Because it makes you sound like a magnanimous son of a bitch. Are you willing to turn the whole group against you to help someone not die? Hey, I, there was a woman that came into a meeting and she was sitting in a corner and she was weeping. And um, 
And see, I pray every time I talk to someone like that, I pray before I say a word, and I don't know who's coming out. I don't know if Genghis Khan or Mother Teresa is coming out. (laughs) So this woman's sitting in the corner, and people are around her, and they're stroking her and tell her she's going to be fine, and she'd been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for about 10 years and had never gotten sober for any period of time at all, and she was back there weeping, talking about what a mess her life was. And when it got around to me, I said, you know, if that lady ever pulls her head out of her ass, she might get sober. Everybody in the room hated me. You know what? I don't care. I just don't care. You either stand for something or you don't. I don't, you know, some lady came up to me the other day and she said, you know, there's something that you have that I'd really want. And I said, what's that? And she said, you really don't care what other people think of you, do you? Mm -hmm. And I said, not a bit. It's life or death. And I don't run around trying to be mean to people. And sometimes I am as gentle as a lamb. But this is a nasty, progressive, and fatal disease. And see, if you have it, and you don't do something with it, it'll do something with you. And what it'll do is it'll drive you insane or kill you. And it'll make your your life so miserable on the way that uh, you will just cry to get out of this life. And you don't have to do that. Let me tell you something about today. I have five sons and two grandsons, and they all love me. It's amazing. I mean, they'd love to spend time with me. I just, uh, I, I live in a four bedroom house in, in Centennial, Colorado, and I can look out my front window, picture window, and see the mountains. Um, you want to know God's sense of humor? I am my company, the one, and I'm 100% owner of this company, is the largest provider of psychiatric care and therapy to the Colorado Department of Corrections. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I was listening to one of our lead staff psychiatrist talking the other day, and she said, I'll have to talk to my director about that. And I'm looking around trying to figure out who the heck she's talking about, right? It's me. (laughs) And then this guy came up to me in an AA meeting. He was kind of put out, and he, he said, what is it about your, what is it about your background that allows you to direct the work of psychiatrists? And I said, I own the business. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I never have been able to figure out God's plan for anybody. But I can tell you to help out better anything we planned. And how would you like to get to that? How would you truly like to reach your potential in Alcoholics Anonymous? And I guarantee that you can do that if you just give yourself to this process. You know, I went out and made amends. I went out and made amends to people I used to kick in their door and bang up against the wall. I made amends to my father, who I hated more than any individual in the world. Um, I do 10, 11, and 12. I mean, I work at this thing. You know, I bet 5% of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous really do step 11 follow the directions and just people just don't do it. it takes too much discipline here's what I wish for you I wish you everything I have I do um, my mind is not cluttered I live in serenity most of the time I have the um I have the appreciation and the respect of my peers in business and in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I really do this thing. Everybody, every once in a while, somebody will come up and say, I always wondered what happened if somebody really followed the directions for 30 years. 
while you're looking at them. Okay? You want to do that? Do that. You can do it. You're not going to lose your friends. You're not going to get any scars. All you're going to do get is a deeper understanding. And when the book talks about growing in understanding and effectiveness, it comes from that experience that we have in following the directions. So um, I want to hasten to say that um, that uh, Russell and Stanley and we, we were riding around with them this weekend and having wonderful food. Boy, they got good restaurants down here. <laughs> and, um, and their lovely wives, and they've been just really helpful. And, uh, and Susan, and you've all made this trip for me uh, exceptional. Um, I hope, I just hope you find the courage to do this. Because if you do, the rewards are way, way beyond your expectations. And you will become someone that you never dreamed you could be. Um, so good luck with that, and thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.